Hi everyone, welcome back to another video. So we're currently going through the Mechatronics uh, book which is written by W. Bolton and it's on instrumentation and control. So if you didn't watch my last video, I definitely advise you to go back and watch that one. What we're basically doing is we're basically skimming through this book here and we're currently on chapter 6. We're skimming through and we're taking notes and I'm taking them in Notion. So we've done a fair amount of notes already thus far and we're just going to carry on from where we left off. Okay. So let's get straight into it. So it was on digital log logic. We didn't write take any notes for that. So we're now on to data presentation systems. So as I mentioned in the last video, as you get further and further into the book, then you expect to be skimming more and more. Right? It's fairly obvious. So um yeah. Alright. So the objectives of this chapter are that after studying it, the reader should be able to explain the problem of loading. In measurement systems, identify common use data presentation elements and describe the characteristics, explain the principles of magnetic and optical recordings, uh, explain the principles of displays, in particular the LED 7 segment display, which I've already done, the dot matrix display, I don't know what that is, and describe the basic elements of data acquisition systems and virtual instruments. Okay, so we're going to talk about displays. This chapter is about how data can be displayed as digits on a light emitting diode display or a display on the computer screen and stored okay on a computer hard disk or cd all right so measurement systems consist of three elements sensor signal conditioning and display or data presentation element okay so a measurement system consists of three elements the sensor the signal conditioning and the display or data presentation element okay so we're talking about displays and we're saying that measurement systems have three elements and they are let's turn this into billeted points turn into numbered points sensor signal conditioner and display or data presentation element Cool. So the purpose of the notes, if you didn't watch the last video, is basically to make sure that I can go through this whole, all these notes here, you know, maybe the day that I start or even throughout the whole module as I'm studying it, I can go back through these whole notes and I can pick up, okay, that's what an up amp is, that's what this is. Especially once when the lecture, when the lecturer is actually teaching, you know, mid lecture or whatever. And I can always just come back and access my notes straight away and look at it and go, okay, that's what that is. And it's a lot easier than having to try and dig through a book or even Googling what it is. And then what I'm going to do as well is in the middle of the module, I'm going to create, I'm going to turn all of these into questions, which I'll make a video on when I do that. And then I'll start testing myself on all of this stuff as well. But I'm only going to do that once I actually study it. At the moment, I'm skimming through the book. Then I'm going to study it and then I'm going to test myself and use active recall and flashcard flashcards space repetition to get all of this to memory. Okay. Traditionally, I've been classified into two groups, indicators and recorders. Okay. Indicators give an instant visual indication of the sensed variable while recorders record the output signal over a period of time and give automatically a permanent record. Uh, okay. All right. Don't really get that. But so we have uh, basically indicator versus recorder displays, right? Okay. Leave that there. So we've got loading. A general point that has to be taken into account of when putting together any measurement system is loading. The effect of connecting a load across the app. I, would, I was thinking loading as in your game's loading. <laughs> uh, so the effect of connecting a load across the output terminals of any element of a measurement system. Loading is the effect of connecting a load across the output terminals. Okay, so you connect a load across the output terminals of a system, that's fine. And then loading is the effect that that has on the measurement system. 
I understand that in terms of a black box with two prongs, A and B, you connect a load to it. What effect does that have on the inter the internals inside the box? I get that. I just can't think of how that would apply. I can't think of real world example like using a thermistor or a transistor. How that, what that does. But that's fine. I'm just gonna. I kind of, I kind of get it. So I'm gonna write, put, jot it down, and then. Uh, so loading. Okay. I try. I don't want to have to fix the text in Notion, but I just, I don't know, man. I'm a bit, I get a bit OCD about it, which is annoying. All right, so skip all the maths. We don't do any maths when we're skimming. Uh, so analog and digital meters to run data presentation elements. Analog and digital meters. The moving coil meter is is an analog indicator with a pointer moving across the scale. Yeah, that's yeah. Of course, that's like we all know what that is. Um. What pops to mind is the electricity, the old electricity and gas meters and stuff like that. Or even uh, the speedometer in your car, right? So the basic instrument movement is a DC micrometer with shunts, multipliers and rectifiers being used to convert it to other ranges of direct current measurement or alternating current. Direct voltage, you what? None of that makes sense. Alternating voltage with alternating current, blah, blah. Okay. What are you talking about? The digital voltmeter gives its reading. Okay, we're talking about so. Oh, okay. So analog digital meter here means literally the meter. It's like a multimeter or principle of digital voltmeter. Analog input sample and hold ADC counter. You talking about multimeters? Ah, I'm gonna just yeah, whatever. That's gonna get skipped. Analog chart recorders. Analog chart recorders have data recorded on the paper by fiber tipped ink pens. You what? By the impact of a pointer press on a car. Okay, yeah, you're getting skipped as well. Too many words I don't understand. Cathode ray oscilloscope. So what are we going over here? What what we're in subheadings of what? Uh data presentation elements. Okay. So let's do this, right? Whenever you don't understand something, you can always just kind of go up or is it up or down a level? Whatever. You can even go up or down a level in abstraction, kind of just saying, it's, I can't give a good example of it. It would be, so, I mean, it's what I'm going to do now. So I don't understand it. So what I do is I put the definition, instead of trying to define what analog and digital meters are, instead I go up a level and define some el some examples of data presentation elements as these and so it i mean firstly it seems like i know what i'm talking about um but secondly it just it means that i understand i know examples of data presentation elements but i don't know what they are and what they do and yeah Uh, visual display unit, okay. Printers, all right. See, so that's just, I just, that's just random. I'm not even getting this. I don't get this at all. Magnetic recording, okay. So this is a, this is a different heading. So, all right. So data presentation elements, and then so let's stick these all into bullet points. Cool. And now I'm moving on to magnetic recording. Whatever that is. All right, so magnetic recording, whoops, uh, is used for the storage of data on floppy disks. Okay, hard disk, fine. <laughs> uh, the basic principles are that a recording head, which responds to the input signal, uh, Okay, all right, yeah, okay. The basic principles are that a recording head which responds to the input signal produces corresponding magnetic patterns on a thin layer of magnetic material and red and read head gives an output by converting the magnetic patterns on the magnetic material to electrical signals. I didn't know that that was how it worked actually. I was wondering because obviously I, I assumed it's not actually writing, like physically changing the disk. Because how would the hard drives, you know, live that long? How would they be used? 
you'd it'd get destroyed, right? So it, it kind of it makes sense that it's not a permanent thing, but it is. Is it? I don't know. Let's read that again. The basic principles are that a recording head, which responds to the input signal, produces corresponding magnetic patterns on a thin layer of magnetic material, and a reed head gives an output by converting the magnetic patterns on the magnetic material to electrical signals. Again, I don't really get that. It's absolutely genius that somebody somewhere came up with that. Ridiculous, man. Um, okay. So... This is going to have to be one of those, we'll take your word for it, kind of ones. Okay. Magnetic recording codes. Wow. Now we're going into the weeds here. Okay. Digital recording involves the recording of signals as a coded combination of bits. A bit cell is the element of the magnetic coating where the, magnetic, where the magnetism is either completely saturated in one direction. Uh, yes, I don't know what we're talking about here, so I'm going to just move on. Although, what's these points here? If the flux reversal... Some of the methods commonly used that aren't ever used for what? Okay, one way of overcoming this problem. So we've got a problem. If the flux reversals do not occur sufficiently, <laughs> what are the flux reversals? All right, skip that one. That's fine. Uh, I assume flux reversals like wiping, cleaning, maybe. All right, magnetic disk. Digital recording is very frequently to a hard disk. The digital data is stored on the disk surface along. When was this book written again? Sixth edition. Because I assume SSD doesn't work. Does I assume? Well, yeah. There's no way SSD, SSDs work like this because there's no moving parts or anything. Right. Um. That's fine. I've got to learn how hard drives work, anyways. So, all right, digital recording is very frequently to a hard disk, okay? The digital data is stored on the hard on the disk surface along concentric circles called tracks, a single disk having m many such tracks. A single read write head is used for each disk surface and heads are moved by means of a mechanical actuator backwards and forwards to access different tracks. The disk is spun by the drive and the read write heads read or write data into a track. Wow. Are you as confused as I am? Or what does that even... I mean, like, without pictures... I mean, if I watch a YouTube video on that right now, I'd probably get it. You know, they'd show you, they'd break it down for you. But what? Yeah. Okay. I don't... I don't personally feel like I'm going to have to learn this for my module. However... I'm actually personally interested in it. I would like to learn how hard drives, hard disk works, work. So I'm going to write it and save it down anyways. And it would like, it would be something that I'd like to, you know, learn about and test myself on in future. So let's go for it. All right. But yeah, no, I'm, I didn't, I didn't get that at all. Okay, oh, so there's a picture, and there's read right heads, arms that extend to move heads over the track, and there's, that's the discs. Yeah, not great. All right, optical recordings. I kind of, I, I learned recently about how fiber optics work, and that, that really fascinated me. So I'm going to assume this is something similar. I mean, this is actually saying CD-ROMs. This is old. This is an old book, isn't it? All right. Like magnetic discs, CD-ROMs store the data along their tracks. Unlike a magnetic disc, which has a series of concentric tracks, I don't even know what that word means. A CD-ROM has a spiral track. I know what that word means. The recording surface is coated with aluminium and is highly reflective. Yep, we. I can. I can confirm that that is true. The information is then stored in a track about 0 0.6 micrometers wide. Okay. Or nano, nano, right? Uh, is nano a micro? Let's just check that. Uh, imperial, uh, what's it called? Imperial, it's not, what's, what's it called? Metric. What's the imperial, it's, uh, it's metric. 
metric uh, system chart. There you go. This is the famous one. So the U is micro. Yeah. Obviously, nano is N and pico. Yep. Yeah. So what was that confusing micro with? U is micro and then. I don't know why I was getting confused. Obviously, nano is obviously going to be N. We know that. Nanometers. So, yeah, micro. Okay, so it's, uh, the information is then stored in a track about 0 0.6 micrometers wide uh, as a series of pits. What's, what does that mean? Pits. Etched into a surface by focus light from a laser in a beam. You can see now how, like, we're 159 pages in and I'm lost. Like, you've lost me. So I'm going to skip this. I'm, I'm not really bothered about how um, CD-ROMs work. All right. Many display systems use light indicators to indicate on-off statuses or give alphanumeric displays. The term alphanumeric is a contraction of the terms alphabetic and numeric and describes displays of letters, the alphabet and numbers 0 to 9 with decimal points. One form of such display is seven light segments, seven segment display. And I know exactly how that works. So that's fine. I'm going to skip that. Okay. So we're basically going over now the different types of displays, right? And I feel like I should make a list of the different types of displays that can be used. Um, it will be good to know and have an idea of what are the different types of displays that you can use. And just because obviously you intuitively, you know what a seven second display is, you know what a CD-ROM is. So. I don't need to write down really like what they are, even with the magnetic disc, I'm thinking to remove that. So let's do, okay, so what's the subheading here? 6.5 we're at, 6.51, and we're at displays, okay. So let's go displays, although we've already got displays, don't we? Yeah, displays. Let's do types of displays. All right, and then let's put, is it the seven segment display the first one? No, okay, light mean diodes. Light mean diodes, so LEDs require low voltages and low currents and are cheap. Um, so this is like basically a seven second display, I assume. And then we have liquid crystal. I don't know what we're trying to teach us here. Okay. It's fine. This is this is deep stuff now, so I'm not gonna get okay. And then we're just straight into DAC. Okay. I think from yeah, well at least for the rest of this chapter anyways, I'm going to just mainly focus on subheadings. Okay, so we've got types of displays. I don't know how we've now jumped to data acquisition. I mean, we've kind of covered that already, anyways. All right, so computer with plug-in boards. Yep. So types of data acquisition systems. Computer with plug-in boards. And then... Uh, data loggers. Okay. Used for DAC systems which are able to be used away from a computer. Okay. So, can be used for DAC away from the, away from a computer. It's like, you know, when you see those animal documentaries and they put like a camera or whatever around the tree to track where the tiger's going. That's what that, like, like that. Um, I didn't really get a definition for computer plugin boards. So the basic elements of DAC system using plug-in boards with a computer for the DAC hardware. So using plug-in boards with a computer for DAC. It's kind of like explaining the title really. Let's just put it anyways. Oh, Notion can be frustrating copying and pasting into. Okay, so we're done with that. So you can see, that, I mean, this book, to get through this book, you're talking, you know, I would, I would assume it would take me 100 hours to get through this book. 
All right, so load cell. Where are we at now? We're at. We're on measurement systems now. Okay. It seems to be. I mean, maybe I'm not paying attention. I seem to be jumping all over the place. I'm now onto measurement systems. Okay. So we've got a load cell for use as a link to detect load lifted. A link type load cell of the form has four strain gauges attached to a surface and can be inserted in between the cable lifting a load and the load to give a measure of the load being lifted. Two of the. Okay. All right. I'll take your word for that one. Temperature alarm system. A measurement system is required which will set off an alarm when the temperature of a liquid rises above 40 degrees. The liquid is normally at 30 degrees. The output from the sensor must be a one volt signal to operate the alarm. Uh, okay. I kind of get that. Uh, angular position of a pulley wheel. What's a pulley wheel? Potentiometer is used to monitor the angular position of a pulley wheel. Consider the items that might be needed in to enable. Okay. Are we on like? Is this asking us questions now? Temperature measurement. To give a binary output. Consider the requirement for a temperature measurement system for temperatures in the range 0 to 100, and which would give an 8 bit binary output with a change in 1 bit corresponding to a temperature change of 1 degrees Celsius. Uh, okay. I'm not, I don't really, I'm not really sure what we're doing here. Like, Okay, testing and calibration. Testing and measurement system installation falls into three stages. Pre-installation testing, okay. Piping and cable, cabling testing, and pre-commissioning. Okay. So I'm cool with that. So let's do testing. Uh, three stages of testing. All right, and then we've got Yep, and then we've got pre-commissioning. Okay, and then we're moving on to calibration now. We all know what the word means, but what, what is actually calibration? Calibration consists of comparing the output of a measurement system and its subsystems against standards of known accuracy. Um... Okay, yeah, yeah. Standards may be other instruments which are kept specially for calibration duties. Okay, that's why you have calibration devices. Yep. Or some means of defining standard values, like uh, like boiling water being 100 degrees. So you're like, okay, if your water's not, if your water doesn't look like that, then it's not boiling. All right? It's like something that's a known standard. Okay. I'm right with that. I don't want to go into the weeds of that and how that's done. I'm just alright with knowing. I didn't know what calibration, how I would would have defined that previously, and now I know, and I'm happy with that. As a guy who wants to skim read, I'm trying to keep it simple here. Alright, so we're at the summary now, so we can skip all of this. This is some nice juicy math questions for you guys, and then we're down to part three. So how how much do we have of the book left? Part three, and we've got part four, part five, and we've got a conclusion. So, I mean, we're not even, we're not anywhere near through the book. <laughs> uh, but I can see that I'm reaching my my limit. I've, I'm I'm close to the ceiling, basically. You know, it's like you're on the ladder, and you could take another step, but you can already your head's already touching the ceiling. And you're gonna have to start bending. So that's where I am at. So. I don't, I'll be surprised if I can make it through this chapter without giving up. So, let's go. Okay, so, pneumatic and hydraulic actuation systems. Nice, I'm actually interested in actuators. Alright, so actuations, actuation systems. Actuation systems are the elements of control systems which are responsible for transforming the output of a microprocessor to or control system into a controlling action or machine or device okay 
So the output of a microprocessor into a machine or device. That's cool. I'm alright with that. Situation system. And then let's do let's put this here, chapter seven. Let me that big and like that. Like that. Pneumatics is the term used when compressed air is used and hydraulics when a liquid, typically oil. Okay. So basically defining these terms. I've never heard of, or I never, I wouldn't have understood. I've, I, you obviously know hydraulic press and stuff like that, but I didn't know it was, a liquid was used. Um, so pneumatics and hydraulics, oops. Pneumatics versus hydraulics. Okay. So pneumatic and hydraulic systems. Pneumatic signals are often used to control final control elements. Even when the control system is otherwise electrical. Uh, so what's pneumatic again? Uh, compressed air. Okay. This is because such signals can be used to accurate. Uh, okay, I don't. Let's just go with this. Hydraulic systems can be used for even higher power control devices, but are more expensive than pneumatic systems, uh, and there are hazards with oil leaks. Okay. okay. All right, so hydraulic systems. With a hydraulic system, pressurized air oil is provided by a pump driven by an electric motor. Okay. Um, pneumatic systems. With a pneumatic power supply, an electric motor drives an air compressor. Okay. Yeah, that's fairly straightforward. So I'm, I'm keen to not go a bit too deep into this, but even this, this is still a fair amount of information. I, I couldn't define either of these terms five minutes or two minutes ago. So this is nice. You know, I, this is something that I'd be able to, to put to memory. Okay, so let's skip this. So valves, valves are used with hydraulic and pneumatic systems to direct and regulate the fluid flow. They're basically just two forms of valve, the finite position and infinite position valves. The finite position valves are ones where the action is just to allow all blocks to open or closed. Yeah. Uh, they can be used for directional control to switch the flow from one path to another and so on. The infinite position valves are able to control flow anywhere between fully on and fully off. So kind of open, kind of closed, etc. Okay, so that's quite interesting as well. There's all these things that you know we know we you know you know what a valve is, but you know when you're when you're learning about it as an engineer, it's just completely different. Nice, it was really nice learning this stuff. I was actually talking to one of my um, classmates, and he was saying he's looking forward to this module as well. So it's nice. I'd love to look, you know, look back on this video in a year's time and be like, "You idiot! Can't believe you just learned about valves." Then I've never, I never thought about valves, whether you know, fully open, fully closed, or you know, could they vary in between what that would be called? Okay, so valves are used with hydraulic and pneumatic systems to direct and regulate fluid flow. Okay, there are two forms of a valve: the finite position and the infinite position. So the finite position valves are just to allow or block, okay? Um, I want to keep it as short and sweet as possible. The infinite position valves are able to control flow anywhere, anywhere between fully on and fully off. Cool. I'm comfortable with that. Directional control valves, pneumatic and hydraulic systems are used that 
Use directional control valves to direct the flow of fluid through a system. Directional. As an, as an electrical engineer, am I going to be using flows of fluid? I don't even know, like, I didn't even stop to think why I'm actually going through this. Is this, I'm, what, I'm still, I'm, I'm still, I'm in actuation, actuators now. Okay, so, all right, we're going to, so, okay. So we've got pneumatic and hydraulic actu, actu, actuation systems. Then we go on to mechanical ones, then electrical actuation systems. So I'll cover these ones in the, the kind of introduction part of it here. And I'll skip the whole mechanical part and just go just go jump straight to the electrical part. Uh, okay, so directional control valves, pneumatic and hydraulic systems use directional control valves to. They are not intended to vary the rate of flow, of but are either completely open. Or, okay, let's just get into more detail. I'll skip that. Valve symbols. We don't need to know that for now. I'm only interested in having the overview of the topic and not specific details like symbols cylinders the hydraulic or pneumatic cylinder is an example of a linear actuator the principles and form are the same for both versions differences being purely a matter of size as a consequence of the higher pressures used with hydraulics the cylinder uh okay i'm gonna skip that talking about like pistons and cylinders and stuff Cylinder sequencing, uh, servo and proportional control valves, valve bodies and plugs. Uh, that's fine. Skip that. This is a very very detailed book. Example of fluid control system. Okay, rotary actuators. A cylinder can with suitable mechanical linkages be used <laughs> okay oh okay okay i've always said a cylinder can <laughs> as in coke can a cylinder can be used that's very weird how they've written that a cylinder can be used to produce rotary movement through angles less than 360 degrees uh initiating such figures initiating such an arrangement another alternative is semi-rotary actuator uh okay let's get that and the right summary okay that's fine so I said I would skip the mechanical one, but let's just let's just get a, a brief look at what it is. All right. Mechanical systems. This chapter is consideration of mechanisms. Mechanisms are devices which can be considered to be motion converters in that they transform motion from one form to some other required form. They might, for example, transform linear motion into rotational motion or motion in one direction into a motion in a direction at right angles. Mate, Dave, you're just speaking gibberish to me now, right? I don't even, not even understanding that at all. Okay, let's just get the bog standard definition and we move on from it. okay i'm okay with that if you're okay with that types of motion the motion of any rigid body can be considered to be a combination of translational and rotational motions uh yeah man you see look like the motion of any rigid body okay rigid body so just a, a thing right can be considered to be so something hard <laughs> can be considered to be a combination of translational and rotational motions considered to be a combination of translational I'm rotational. Translational as in moving? Yeah, okay. So you've moved in the X, Y, or Z axis. Okay. Yeah, that's what you've got here. So you've moved there. And rotational meaning that you've stayed in the same place, but you've turned yourself. Okay. Yep, I've got that. That's a space. Translation motion can, can be considered to be a movement, which can resolve. Okay. I actually get that. I get that. I don't think it's important for me to write this down by will, but yeah, I get that. It's interesting, but you know, we'll think about it. I do enjoy learning, but I don't think I need this. So. 
Okay, so I'm going to skip now to the electrical actuation systems. Uh, actually, I'm going to do the right thing. The right thing to do is to just skip through at least just look, get an idea of the, the title. So freedom of constraints, an important aspect in the design of mechanical elements is the orientation and arrangement of elements and parts. Okay, skip that. We've got loading again. Mechanisms are structures and such transmit and support loads. Analysis is thus necessary to determine the load. The loads to be carried by individual elements. Then consideration can be given to the dimensions of the elements so that it might, for example, have sufficient strength and perhaps stiffness under such loading. Yeah, I just read that. I don't even know why I finished reading it. I didn't get it anyway. Kinetic chains. All right, when we consider the movement of a mechanism, you know when you just read something, you're just spaced out. You're reading but that's all you're doing okay so kinetic chains when we consider the movement of a mechanism without any reference uh no okay you start speaking physics and my mind just turns my mind's like force kinetic what i had to stop okay so i should have really like i said just skipped the whole chapter so we've got gear trains are mechanisms which are very widely used to transfer uh, and transform rotational motion they are used when a large, oh, when a large, when a change in speed or torque. Okay. Sorry, gears. Gear trains. Nice one. Rotational to translational motion. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. This is for mechanical people. Yep, okay, so at least we finished that. I will, just, just to bear in mind, when I'm actually studying this book, I will make a real actual effort to understand this. Um, I don't, I'm not saying I'll be successful. <laughs> I probably won't be able to understand it. But I will actually take, you know, an hour, one afternoon, and try to understand that whole chapter. So, you know, it's what, I mean, why not, right? Like, you don't want to just be, you know, the type of engineer or whatever, where you're just super one dimensional. You at least want to kind of have an idea. If you're talking to your mechanical engineering colleague, then he's talking to you about gear, torque, uh, force, whatever. You don't want to be how I feel right now, which is I just heard a whole bunch of gibberish and didn't get any of it. You want to at least be able to say, okay, I understood what you said. I trust your opinion. Go with it, you know, fine. Okay, so let's move on to electrical actuation systems where hopefully I should have more success in understanding this. So, one chapter nine. I wonder how many individual chapters there are. Can we see? Uh, this is nine, and then we go to chapter 24. Okay, oh wow, look at that. There's a chapter on artificial intelligence. Nice. Assembly language C. Eh, it's not so bad. Like, I'm going to skip, you know, the assembly language and skip the C. Um, I look forward to programming logic, logic controllers because that's an important one this semester. So, okay. All right. So, electrical actuation systems. Get that saved. Okay, so this is the juicy stuff. In any discussion of electrical systems used as actuators for control, the discussion has to include switching devices, solenoid type devices, and drive systems. Okay, so electrical systems have to include... Not that they have to include, but... Um, the discussion has to include, but I'm just going to leave it as has to include for now. So we've got switching devices... We got solenoid type devices and we got drive systems. So I know that solenoid is like what we covered up there, you know, the hydraulic stuff. Drive systems, I assume, is like DC motors and stuff, and switching is going to be relays, transistors, that kind of stuff. Um, so mechanical switches are elements which are often used as sensors to give inputs to systems. You are, okay, mechanical, mechanical switches are elements which are often used as sensors 
right? Yep, to give as inputs to systems. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, I'm all right with that. So let's put mechanical systems. Oh, switches, sorry. Relays. Um, do I need? Do I really need to? Obviously, I don't actually. I'm not actually. I've never used a relay before. So yes, I need to learn what relays are. But do I need to be writing about them? That's my point. I I I, I would say no. I probably don't. But let's just do it. So I didn't even read. I didn't even read what this says. So relays are electrical operated switches in which changing a current in one electric circuit switches a current on or off in another circuit. Yep, that's fine. That's true. I'm okay with that. So we'll skip this. Solid state switches. SSW. Uh, solid state switches. SSS. Uh, there. I don't know why I said SSW. I'm losing it, mate. I'm absolutely losing it. Right, so we have the number of solid state devices which can be used electronically to switch circuits. These include diodes, varistors, What's that? Triax, I don't even know what that is. Bipolar transistors, obviously you know what that is. And then MOSFETs. Okay. The solid state switches, and these, these are... So what are these used for? Used electronically to switch circuits. Yep, I'm okay with that. So we've got diodes. Um, diodes. The diode has a characteristic shown only a passing current when forward. Has a characteristic. Okay, really weird way of saying that. It only passes a current when forward biased. If the diode is sufficiently reverse biode, biased, a very high voltage, it will break down. <laughs> what? I.e. a very... Okay, okay, yeah. If you apply a high enough voltage in reverse of a diode, yes, of course, yeah. It will break down, yeah. If an alternative voltage is applied across a diode, it can be regarded as only switching on when the direction of the voltage is such as to forward bias it and being off in reverse bias direction. Okay, so that covers, I'm not actually that confident in diodes. I don't feel like this is gonna be the module where I'm gonna learn about them though. Um, I was saying I might be wrong, so let's just kind of covering it. So it has a characteristic only passing current when force bowed biased. Right. If voltage is facing reverse, reverse biased, it will break down. Yep. If an alternate, if an alternating voltage is applied across the diode, it can be regarded as only switching on when the direction of the voltage is such as to forward bias it and being off in the reverse bias direction. Yep, I'm okay with that. The fryeristers and triacs. No idea what these are. As you can probably tell by my pronunciation, which is probably wrong. The thyristor or silicon controlled rectifier can be regarded as a diode. Uh, okay. Which has a gate controlling the conditions under which the diode can be switched on. It's a diode. Okay. And it has a gate which controls the conditions for which it can be switched on. No. You lost me at thyristor. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Um, we'll leave it at that. We'll come back to you. Uh, it's a bunch of graphs. Okay. Bipolar transistors. We know what you are. We'll write you down anyway. It's just because we've written down everybody else. I don't want to leave you out. The so bipolar transistors come in two forms. The MPN and PNP. Can talk about the junction. Okay, for the MPN transistor, the main. Okay, nice. It doesn't actually go into 
you know, doped, doping and all the rest of that jazz. Okay, so uh, the for the NPN transistor, the main current flows in at the collector and out at the emitter, a controlling signal being applied to the base. Yep. And a PMP transistor has the main current flowing in at the emitter and out at the collector, a controlling signal being applied to the base. Yes. Got it. That's cool. I'm okay with that. So let's just clean it up. Okay. Before the MPN, PMP. Yep. Let's just stick this picture in because, you know, why not? It wouldn't be proper note taking if you didn't have of uh, any electronic electrical course if you didn't have a picture of this. Probably, I've probably got this picture a thousand times saved in my, in my notion. Okay, so let's carry on. So MOSFETs, there we go. I was wondering which one was missing. MOSFETs, there you go. And it's going to give us metal oxide field effect transistor. Yeah, that does there. Come in two types, the N channel and P channel. Okay, the main difference between the use of a MOSFET for switching and a bipolar transistor is that no current flows into the gate to exercise the control. The gate voltage is the controller signal. Thus, drive circuitry can be simplified in that there is no need to be concerned about the size of the current. Yes, this is true. Okay, I, I need to brush up on my MOSFET stuff. Again, like I said, I did not do well in digital electronics. So I'm going to need to go over that. Okay. We've got drain, source, gate. Um, let's do it like this. Um, actually, let's get the DC motor in as well. Why not? Okay. Yep. Comfortable with that. Okay. Um. So solenoids. Solenoids consist of a coil of electric wire with an armature, which is attract atta attracted attracted to the coil when a current passes through it and proceeds. Produces a magnetic field, which is basically motors, right? So let's just, you're just describing really motors here. That's fine. Linear or rotary on, off, or variable position and operate by DC or AC. Okay. All that definition is fine. Okay. Um no I'm not very concrete on this, but that's fine. Okay. So direct current motors. Electric motors are frequently used so DC motors. <laughs> uh yeah. Um so I've already kind of co covered i mean not kind of i have def i've covered this already in my first year so again it's i wonder i'm not sure how much is going to be an overlap how much is going to be more of a deep dive into what you've already studied uh i don't know so we've got brush type dc motor and then brush type with field coils Okay, so the speed of a permanent magnet motor depends on the current through the armature coil. Okay, so speed of 
Okay, wait, so let me just get. I just want to get a picture of this bit here. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually test myself. I'll block out on flash using flashcards. I'll block out one of these, and then ask me to, or it'll get the flashcards will get me to ask which one of them is missing. So that would be a good little test revision thing for me. Okay. This is pulse switch modulation. Okay with that. Brushless permanent magnet DC motors. And brushes, the brushes wear out, blah blah blah. So then we so wanna get a brushless motor. Okay. They require commuter and brushes in order to periodically to reverse. They require commutator and brushes in order to periodically in order periodically to reverse the current through each armature coil. The brushes make sliding contacts with the commu commutator and as a consequence sparks jump between the two and they suffer wear. Brushes thus have to be periodically changed and the computer resurfaced. So, due to wear and tear, brushes have to be periodically changed and the computer resurfaced. Okay, commutator. Um, so, where is it talking about what actual? Okay, so essentially they consist of. A sequence of stator coils and a permanent magnet rotor. The current carrying conductors in a magnetic field experiences a force likewise. Okay. So brushless motors consist of this. And that's what I'm just going to leave it at that. Instead. And then they... Consists of a sequence of stator coils and permanent magnet rotor. There you go. Okay. So AC motors, it's possible to classify AC motors in two groups, single phase and polyphase. So you've got AC motors. And then you've got Single phase versus polyphase. Okay, so what's the difference? So the single phase, uh, single phase motors. Okay, right. Single phase motors tend to be used for low requirement, low power requirements. Uh, okay, so this is just saying what they're used for. Probably a good thing to learn. Put to memory. Okay. Um, there are no external electrical connections. Okay, wait. so the single phase squirrel cage induction motor consists of a squirrel cage rotor. This being copper, the single phase uh, versus polyphase. It doesn't really talk about it. Again, I haven't actually learned AC. I don't know anything about AC right now, other than it kind of goes across diodes and capacitors but other than that I don't really know anything about it so this isn't really making too much sense to me uh, again like I said you know this all of this is expected you could clearly see from the yet yeah, from the, the previous video at the beginning of that video to the end there was a difference in how I was studying and now you can see even the beginning of this video 
to the end there's, there's a difference it's getting more and more difficult to understand what's going on but remember the point here is not really to learn a whole bunch of stuff it's to get a good understanding of what the what the module or what your topic is about so that when you're in the weeds when you're stuck in the weeds in two months time and you're you're just you're trying to figure out why why you can't understand this gear calculation and you're just like oh, i can't understand torque and gear you put it into perspective it's not that big of a deal in the whole module so you could just skip over it right but if you don't know what's being taught you might be thinking that the whole module is based you need to know the gears the torque calculations everything and you know this happened to me last year where i got stuck in the weeds with gear torque motor calculations and i didn't use it at all in the assessment so yeah again hey if you're seeing if you're watching this thinking this guy doesn't know what he's talking about he's literally every topic now he's like uh what's this what's this yes it's to be expected i expected it <laughs> okay so we're on ac um let's move on to stepper motors so a stepper motor is a device that produces rotation through equal angles the so-called steps which is to post supply to each input all right it's fine and then there's different types of stepper motors right types variable reluctant stepper oh dear Permanent magnet stepper, the PM stepper, hybrid stepper, I learned something from Joe Rogan that um, apparently hybrid animals can never breed, interesting right, think about a liger or any other hybrid animal you can think of, uh, was it a mule, the donkey and a the horse, they can't breed, which is interesting, so you can you can get a donkey and a mule to appropriate uh, re re what's it what's it called the word anyways to produce a child or a offspring and it'll be a mule but that mule is um what's the word i was about to say it's celibate mate it's uh 4 a.m so i can't think straight but anyways yeah mules and ligers stuff like that they can't reproduce so yeah just thought i'd tell you that i don't know I don't know why it came to me when I'm thinking about stepper motors, but it is what it is. All right, so stepper motor specifications. So we're going to skip all of this for now. Stepper motor control. Uh, we'll skip that as well. I've still got hybrids on my brain. Okay, selection of stepper motor. That's fine. Inertia matching. Okay, so when selecting a motor for a particular application, factors that need to be taken into account include inertia matching, Torque requirements and power requirements. So, yeah, this is quite um, mechanical stuff. So, I'm gonna just basically uh, struggling just to copy and paste right now. Gonna just do motor selection like this, and then just have that like that. Yeah, I'm happy with that. And I'm just gonna skip all of this mechanical jazz yes it's probably important and like i said i will actually take the time to go through and go and learn the whole this uh, go through the whole thing but for now i i'm guessing my lecturer is not going to assess me on any of that kind of stuff so we'll see though okay so we're moving on to microprocessor systems what I think I'll do is because I've realized that these videos are getting very, very long and it's taking me a long time to get through this book. So I'm going to end this particular video here and then I'll start another video on the microprocessor systems and we'll just carry on going through. So where are we now? We're on part, uh, what's this? It's about four or five. I can't read very many numerals. So we're on part four now out of five. I know there's a conclusion bit as well. So we're on to chapter 10 out of 24 chapters. So my guess is I'm probably gonna have to do another two videos on top of this one. 
However, I'm hoping, looking at this chapter, might be able to fly through this one fairly quickly. Um, it's probably just the input output systems I'm interested in and the programmable logic controllers. Oh no, communication systems, I suppose, as well. Although that's actually a complete separate module, so yeah. Anyways, I'll end this video here and then we'll get started on part three. Cool. Thanks for watching, guys. If you have watched the whole way through, what are you doing? You, you've got to subscribe if you haven't already. So subscribe and please leave a like. I know YouTube is not a fan of these long videos. Usually it's the, the 10 minute, the video should be 10 minutes or whatever. But for me, I like this kind of stuff. I like long videos. I like learning a bunch of stuff. And so if you like it as well, give it a like. Thanks guys. And I'll see you in part three. Peace.